Your Highness, Your Excellency, it's a pleasure for me to introduce you uh, one of the most remarkable photographers that I know and the work he does. It's uh, Joel Sartori. He's a photographer, speaker, author, teacher, conservationist. Uh, he's a National Geographic Fellow and a regular contributor to the National Geographic magazine. It is all that a modern photographer should be, not just taking photos, but also making a change. His hallmarks are a sense of humor and a Midwestern work ethic. Joel specializes in documenting endangered species and landscapes in order to show a world worth saving. Getting face to face with a spitting cobra or a orangutan is all part of a day's work for Joel. Sartori uses photography to promote conserv conservation of animals and their habitats. In 2006, he founded the Photo Arc Project with National Geographic to document species in zoos and sanctuaries around the world. His goal is to create portraits of the estimated 15,000 species in captivity and inspire people to help protect at-risk species. In his words, it's folly to think that we can destroy one species and ecosystem after another and not affect humanity. When we save spe species, we're actually saving ourselves. Joel has numerous contributions to National Geographic, Audubon Magazine, Time, Life, Newsweek, Sports Illustrated, and book projects. And he is the subject of several national broadcasts, including National Geographic's Explorer or NBC Nightly, Week, New, Nightly News. He's also featured in three-part series on PBS Tate titled Rare, Creation, Cre Creatures of the Photo Arc. I'm happy to introduce him to you, and I'm uh, looking forward to listen to your talk and show us the ark and all the animals that are in it. Joel Sartori. Thank you for coming. Um, we can start. There we go. So. Um, I don't have very many, I watched the underwater series yesterday and I'm afraid that I'm a very poor man's version of an underwater photographer. I, uh, I photograph what I do to the best of my ability, but you're going to see time and time again today how a guy can mess up, how not to do it. So, uh, but that's all right. Geographic people were very nice and they ignored my flaws over the years. The number one question I get in any question and answer period is have you ever come close to getting killed on assignment. And one lady asked me if I ever had been killed on assignment yet. And I said, no, not yet. But um, we do things, things kind of the hard way sometimes because we have to be close and we have to get readers engaged. We want people to care. I learned over time to use camera traps, line of sight, and motion detected camera traps. But in some cases, I thought it would be okay to just shove my camera in a bull bison's face and pop off a flash. And they don't like that, it turns out. So they pin you underneath the truck for, I don't know, 30 minutes. And while you're down there, you may as well take pictures because why not? Nothing else to do while you're down there. Most of the time, though, it's the little stuff that gets you. It's not, you know, being bitten by a grizzly bear or a polar bear. It's getting insect-borne disease. From bats in Uganda, I got a hot poop in my eye, and that gave me a chance of getting Marburg virus, which is like Ebola, but you bleed a lot less before you die. You don't remember it much because the fever's terrible, just terrible. I was in quarantine for three weeks, and David Quammen, the noted conservation author, called me on day two, and he said, hey, do you want to talk to the only lady that's ever survived it? I just interviewed her for my book, Spillover. She'd talk to you. She can talk again. I said, great. So I, I talked to her, and she said, I said, how bad was Marburg? Now, this is on day two of 21-day quarantine, so I had lots to think about after my conversation. She said, well, it cooks you. I was given last rites twice, but I don't remember any of it. And after my fever broke and I got well again, it was a year before I could go out, and I went to the grocery store, and I had to use a scooter in the cereal aisle. I had no energy. So, but I didn't get it. Here I am speaking in front of you fine folks today. But we're asking for it a little bit because we go places most people don't. And we're also very nervous 
that we are going to fail and starve and die in that order if we don't produce pictures that Kathy Moran finds suitable to get into National Geographic, right? There she sits. So Kathy Moran is a towering legend in the field of photography in terms of editing natural history. This was not her story, but Sarah Lean was the editor on this. And, and I remember I shot this because I hadn't made a good picture in three days. And they have said many times, we cannot publish your excuses, Joel. And so I just let the mosquitoes eat me up. And then after it was published, I got a coupon for a free pedicure from her husband which is nice, but it is kind of insulting. I think my toenails look just fine. So I'll try to take you on assignment with me as well. Uh, up the Amazon, I got the first out-of-country experience I ever had. The then Associate Director of Photography, Kent Koberstein, said, we want you to go to Medidi National Park in Bolivia. And I, I tried to turn him down. I had an appointment. To, I was going to go out and watch the Jerry Lewis Telethon in Las Vegas. And he, said, and he banged his phone on his desk, and he said, why? I said, it's just something that I do. Jerry Lewis is very rude to people. He's a now dead movie star. And he said, you're going to go. And I said, okay. So I looked up Medidi and Bolivia. I had no idea where it was. And you ride upstream for a day in a little boat, and they've prepared you a big meal of fish and puppies to eat for dinner. I'm kidding about the puppies. They were just sleeping, Simon. We didn't eat them. But then, you know, it was rough because I was not used to living in, um, in conditions like this. We had a mosquito net over our mess tent. It was in the jungle in the Bolivian Amazon in the middle of nowhere. And uh, mosquitoes and termites and everything would just get through that mess tent. They swarmed our candle one morning and all of them dropped their wings in our cereal bowls. And I dropped 35 pounds in a month. Um, it was really bad. And I was frightened, to be honest with you. I... Um, I kept a little diary, and that diary helped get the magazine, this story into the magazine. There were lots of bad things that happened, lots of bad things. Um, we, had a we had one of our guides at one of our camps get a fungus all over him that drove him crazy, and he wandered through the jungle and got lost and survived just drinking river water, and that was, we had a, we had a camp cook got hit with a stingray, and she was in bed for six weeks, and our boat driver happened to put her in the family way, and he... He promised to marry her at the end of the trip, and he did. That was nice. But all that happens in like a month, you know. There are very few shooting situations because the jungle is so thick that you can't see 15 feet. So I photographed out in clearings wherever I could. We set up platforms. This is our lead guide, Choco. He has a terrible fever, very sick. And uh, we were up on this platform waiting for jaguars, uh, but none came. That's the bathroom in the corner. We were up there for for 10 days, and um, he healed up, and eventually, you know, we found the pigs that the jaguars eat, but he was disappointed, so he drug a cow skin through the forest to a central little clearing, just the smell he thought would bring a jaguar in, and he called one in a couple nights in a row, and he said, you come tonight, the jaguar will come in. This was a big deal when you couldn't just see jaguars very easily, and so the next night, we waited at dusk, and he called this female into this clearing. She has a chunk out of her shoulder from fighting with the pigs that she kills. I was amazed, and I, I tipped him right there. I gave him $100. I said, this is fantastic. Thank you for working so hard. And he said, 100 bucks. I can only get about 15 for her skin in town at the market. Maybe I won't kill her after you're gone. I said, please don't. This is ecotourism at work. And he said, what's ecotourism? I said, you're saving wildlife so that you can make a living and your family too. And so he did. He protected the forest, which was wonderful. Um, my under, my, this basically represents about 50% of my underwater photography experience, as opposed to David Dubelay or Brian Scarry, who have logged tens of thousands of hours. Here you go. You'll see I'm really graceful. The guys like to go piranha fishing for food. And I figure, hey, underwater shots. Underwater shots of piranha. <laughs> So, put on this wetsuit, and when they tell me they've caught one, I'm gonna swim out to them and photograph the fish on the hook, you know? The wetsuit, if I can get it on, is to keep me from looking like food to the prana. Zip me up, Rosemaria. 
No can do. Oh man. I thought I was hot before. Ow! That hurt. Listo. I'm ready. So I got one frame and a really tasty meal. You know how this looks? That's how it tastes. Yeah, it didn't taste very good, but that's okay. That's all right. We built a platform in the sky next to a parrot nesting cliff. The Red and green macaws trusted me enough after a day or two that they would fly by repeatedly. That helped elevate it to the cover. And on the cover, it didn't just say this. In the Spanish edition, which was brand new, it said, Mediti, will Bolivia drown its spectacular new national park? Turns out they were going to build a dam there and drown a thousand square acres of primal rainforest. And they didn't, which was great. That's a nice thing. This story kept on giving, though. After I was home for a while, I had a hole in my lower right leg that would not heal up and it turned into mucocutaneous leishmaniasis. For those of you who aren't familiar, that is a flesh-eating parasite that wants to get into your lymphatic system and blow holes out the front of your face when it eats away your sinus cavities, and that's bad too. So you get a pick line into the top chamber of your heart, and you get a month-long heavy metal IV that's a chemo, and then after a month or so, you're good to go. Yeah, but it was worth it. It was worth it. The other question I get all the time is, how do you get a job with National Geographic? I, um, I was kind of funny. You wouldn't know it today, uh, but I was funny when I was, when I was younger. And I just took kind of pictures that I thought were, were amusing to me and my friends and trying to impress girls, you know, whatever. And so I grew up in Nebraska in the middle of the center of the United States and just took the kind of pictures I thought were interesting. It could be cows watching a pasture fire or it could be these really fat guys that are at a chicken festival in Wayne, Nebraska. They're supposed to be like the Chippendale dancers, but they're called the Chickendale dancers. Um, it could be a guy roping his cat or a guy st dusting the stuffed sheep in a back, uh, the back room of a, store, of a sporting goods store. Dogs make good pictures. Bad dogs make really good pictures. Some dogs are a little worse than others, I guess. But um, those are the types of pictures that got me hired, basically, just shooting funny pictures uh, in the U.S. So naturally, I was a good candidate to do a story on America's state fairs. This is at the Texas State Fair in Dallas. That guy is six foot four and standing upright. It's a mirror illusion. He's not cut in half. He is singing all of me. Why not take all of me? Um, from there, I went to the Iowa State Fair, which had a lot of weird things, and I really enjoy this type of thing. I like eating corn dogs, and this was home to the world's largest corn dog chomp all at once for a Guinness record, which is great. And then at, uh, in the afternoons, they had a very creepy mother-daughter look-alike contest, which I thought was okay. And then uh, at night, they had a hypnotist act, which is also very nice. These people are out like clams at a bake. They aren't pretending. They're just out. They're like farm kids. Then I drove all night to get to the Indiana State Fair for their cockroach tractor pull the next day. My favorite thing was, uh, was, was the Minnesota State Fair, though. They had this, this great carnival there, and they had this ride called the Slingshot. It shoots you 206 feet in the air in under three seconds. And I bolted a radio-controlled camera into the cage. And... Um, what I loved was the ride owner. It was 25 bucks to go up, but he would double the price if he had a long line. And to get a long line, he one day put a live microphone inside that cage and he broadcast with big speakers all the nasty things people scream. Doubled the line, 50 bucks a piece. Pretty smart guy. So um, I thought I would take you through kind of a typical geographic story, a typical coverage way back when, before the photo arc, uh, for a story on grizzly bears, eight weeks, Spread it out over a year, however you want. Eight weeks of assignment time. So, of course, I spent a week doing, doing trained bears in Hollywood. 
because I thought, you know, why not? I'll, I know I'll get good pictures of bears. There are no excuses. Those are my boots up the tree. You notice the tops of the boots are wet a little bit. It's either tears or urine, one of the two. So these bears are very smart, very smart, trainable, but they're not pets. But they also just remind me that, you know, they get along fine with us. They're very malleable. And they, and they, do, things for, they do things for spoonfuls of grape jelly or donut holes, or cookies, or whatever. These bears were being trained for the movies and for advertising, in which we only want two things out of our bears, fake roaring and fake mauling. All we expect is that bears are bloodthirsty, but they're not really, not really. I am pressing this once, I swear you guys, one time. This is at Brooks Falls in Alaska, where I went to go do the rest of my seven weeks of assignment time. I mixed it up, but a lot of it was in Alaska. This is where eight or nine bears have learned to catch salmon at the top of a waterfall. But you can't just show that. You have to back up and show that there's the bear paparazzi right there. Over a million pictures of bears every year. These same bears that shoot, that, that catch fish. Everybody's shooting them. And at night when they go back to the lodge or their tents, I lay out along the river to get pictures of bears like nobody's ever seen before because each coverage in National Geographic has to be the gold standard. It has to be good enough to hold for about 20 years until folks would revisit that story again. This is really why I wanted to do the bear story, though. I'd heard stories for years about a fed bear is a dead bear. These bears get into garbage. They love human garbage because we throw away so many foods, and there's great smells in there, everything you can imagine. This is in Prudhoe Bay, Alaska, about as far north as you can get on, on the continent of North America. And uh, these bears get into trouble. They get used to being around people. They break into cabins and bird feeders and dog feeders, and they get shot and sold as rugs twice a year by the state of Alaska. So that's one typical coverage for me. Another one, this is a three and a half week story on koalas in Australia. In northern Australia, the koala is in a lot of trouble. So a couple of pictures that maybe, maybe are kind of weird to get us started, including more poignant pictures. But again, they ask more questions than they answer, I guess. Why do these human moms have baby koalas with them? Well, they need a lot of care, like a baby primate. But, you know, this is where they live. They live in city parks and golf courses. And when they come out of those trees to find another mate, more food, better roosting cover, they, they have no capability of defending themselves against cars or especially domestic dogs. And I'd done my homework. I researched about a day for every day in the field. And I knew that I could go to one wildlife hospital and they would save one week's worth of koalas all killed by dogs including that mom and baby on the lower left. One week's worth of dead koalas for me. Spread them out on a tarp, filmed them, and it was a very sad process, obviously. But I knew this picture would probably help move the needle, which is the whole point. Move the needle. Get, get people to care and actually take action. So after this picture ran, now there were a lot of people working on getting the koala listed as imperiled there, but after this picture ran and went viral, that happened a couple months later. So I can't say this did it all the way, but it helped. It helped. But you know, in, in, two, in two stories over a 17-year career, that's not very good in terms of moving the needle. We got the dam stopped from being built in Medidi National Park, and we helped get koalas listed as imperiled. In 17 years, 35 stories, that's not really enough for a type A guy like me. But that all changed when uh, I was doing that story on Alaska. My wife... Uh, my wife called me and she said, you ought to get home, you've been gone six weeks. And so she basically threatened to divorce me if I didn't go home, so I did. And I was glad about that. For not long after I got home, maybe uh, three weeks, four weeks, she found a tumor in her right breast. She had breast cancer. And we had three young children at home and she went just down. And I didn't do a thing at home except, you know, get my clothes washed and take off again for many years. I was a Vagabond guy working on one story after the next. And she was so sick from chemo and radiation that she couldn't do anything. And I was, I took care of her, our three kids. We had the youngest one was two. I'd never changed a diaper on him. I didn't really know him. I just knew that he threw a lot of fits in public places and he was irritating. So, um, you know, it, it, this, I had to go to a full stop over a year. One, one full year being at home and not traveling around, and you know, like being a geographic photographer is like, a lot like being an astronaut. What are you supposed to do when you're done with that? 
open a car lot or a restaurant somewhere. I was just home, you know. But that year at home proved to be a big blessing because it allowed me some time to think for a change about what to do. You know, are we going to lose our house? I was a day rate guy. Um, you know, is she going to die? That's obviously the first question. Well, it made me realize how short life is. You know, we last about as long as a snowflake on a spring day. Not very long. Just a little dash between the numbers on our tombstones. That's what we've got. How are we going to make that productive? How are we going to make the world full of less misery and sorrow? What can we do to make our time count? How do we use our time well? These are all the things I thought about during that year. I would wander around the house when she was sleeping, and our little boy was too, and I would look at these prints we had up by John James Audubon. And back in the late 1700s, he knew these birds were all going to go extinct. He could see the future because of this onslaught of humanity. All these European settlers were just going to decimate everything as they turned, the, turned everything over with the plow and cut all the forests including this bird called the passenger pigeon, which numbered up to five billion. And humans market hunted them down to one, and she died in 1914 in the Cincinnati Zoo. The telegraph doomed that bird. They tra traveled and nested in huge communal flocks, and as soon as the telegraph was invented, we could tell each other where the last flocks are, and we hunted them all out. And then I, I remembered to look at a book we had uh, by, by Catlin, who painted Native Americans. And he knew also that European settlement was going to greatly alter Native American culture really badly. And so he, he spent his full, you know, full measure of devotion documenting not only how people looked and dressed, but styles of dance, homes, everything. And then Edward Curtis, who got a grant from J.P. Morgan, the financier, he got 75 grand. And, Curt you know, Curtis was told, you can't, you can't, Keep any of this money yourself, but hire early linguists, hire filmmakers, hire whoever you want. And so he photographed 88 tribes over 48 years. Everything he had, he threw into that. And he gives us a record of things that, that you know, would not be around today if, if not for him. So I thought to myself, okay, if Kathy gets better, I'm going to, maybe I'll try to be like Audubon. And so on days when she felt better, I would go out into Lancaster County, Nebraska, and try to photograph local birds using the correct habitat in the background, as Audubon would do. And each of these pictures I shot with a remote using a spotting scope. And they took between 40 and 60 hours each to do. It's a long time, and it's hard to move the needle if something takes that long. But, um, you know, I didn't know what to do, to be honest with you. The months went by. Kathy healed up. 17 years later, she's just fine to this day and still griping at me about being gone too much. But once she came out of it and said, you can go, um, I started doing hybrid stories. I would go to a location like Equatorial Guinea, photograph the turtle on the beach, but also bring my black and white backgrounds and do, do this type of portrait. And this was thanks to Kathy Moran. Story after story, she got to me knowing that I would moonlight and work on the photo arc along with my magazine stuff. Instead of a camera trap for an ocelot, maybe we go find one that's captive and really look him in the eye. At the bushmeat market in West Africa, this, mandrel, this young mandrel is going to be turned into stew. Well, we bring black velvet, and we get him when he sees himself for the first time in the flat reflection of my camera lens filter. So that's how the photo art got started. Really, that's, that's it. Time and again, I would do these hybrid stories, usually for Kathy Moran. Uh, amphibian decline. These are animals that have been killed by a fungus that sweeps the world, mainly attacks cold weather frogs, montane frogs. But then we would do portraits, as many as I could along the way, all the time. And we use those in the magazine as well to fill out the story. Amphibians are amazing. They've been around hundreds of thousands, millions of years. They take in toxins through their skin. And they have to have stable rainfall. Gee, we do too. Maybe we should pay attention to them. At one lab in Quito, Ecuador, where I went for, a, for nearly a week, this little guy in a white lab coat brought out frog after frog. This one, he said, there's only nine of this left. We don't know how old ours are. We don't know how to get them to breed. And we don't know what they eat. Take a picture, quick. Five of this one. Three of this. Two of this. That's, that's the common signal for amphibians. A big chunk of them are going to go away because of all the trouble we're creating. This is a frog I photographed on the way home, the very last Rab's fringed limb tree frog. He is uh, named Tuffy because he 
outlived all life expectancies. But eventually he passed away too. And this species is now extinct. We know that. So I just figure this. I show him everywhere I go. And I think really the key to our salvation lies, lies in this brown, slimy being the size of a golf ball. If we get people to care enough about what happens to a frog, maybe they'll care about everything else. These species have all gone extinct in the time that I've been doing the project. I've only been doing the project 15 years. These species were around for hundreds of thousands or millions of years. That's a lot. That's a lot to lose. Just what I've come across, just the ones in captivity that are under good care, we're losing those. Yeah, but it's not just bugs and rabbits, it's rhinos. Northern white rhino, there were five of them left when I did the portrait of this old one in the Diver, Diver Kralave Zoo in the Czech Republic. She laid down afterwards and took a nap, but she eventually passed away too. And now there's two, two, two females, a mom and daughter in a pen in Kenya. That's it. Well, what will we do when this animal dies, when this animal goes extinct? We'll write some sad editorials for the newspapers, and we'll go on and do it again and again. Maybe this will change people's minds. I don't know. I'm a desperate guy trying anything I can to get people to, to pay attention and care before 50% of what life is gone. This is a graph that's 10 years old, the mammalian biomass. In blue is the stuff we eat, like, like pigs and goats and sheep and cows. In red is us, that little green sliver. That's all the, all the big charismatic mammals you've ever cared about from storybooks when you were a kid or the movies. That's your elephants, your zebras, giraffes, tigers, gorillas. That sliver of green is a lot smaller because this graph was done in 2011. But because we can see it coming, just like Audubon, just like Curtis, just like Catlin, it doesn't take a genius to figure out where we're going. It's pretty easy. An onslaught of 11 billion people. And nobody's saying a word about that because what do you do? Tell somebody they can't have a kid? I got three. What a hypocrite. I don't know. This desperate photographer decides, well, maybe we'll do something that's light and entertaining. Maybe we'll make these animals look like they have human emotions. We'll look them in the eye. We're primates. That works. Eye contact's big. And we'll just make animals look like they're having a good time or they're very soulful and, and try to get people really to get in there and see that there's grace and beauty no matter the size. We photograph all these animals on black and white backgrounds to eliminate size, to size comparisons. That mouse is the same size as an elephant. These little critically endangered pahrump pool fish from Nevada, they're bigger than a polar bear. And that's important because most of the species that are in trouble are not big and popular and famous. They are little bitty guys. They're things that we don't know exist, that we don't care about. They're not all grizzly bears. They're sloths. They're shifakas. Baby gorillas, you bet. Lots of attention. People love baby animals, especially popular baby animals. But this... A snub-nosed monkey from China? Maybe not so much. And are they pretty? I don't know. They're interesting. Does that count? Will that hook them? What's beautiful about this day and age, this time we live in, is there's never been a better time in the history of mankind to be a conservationist because we can reach the entire world through the web and we can read people's minds. We absolutely can. We know that we get, when we put something out on social, we can see what people are sticking with. We can see how long they stick with it. We can see how many people they, they send it on to. They love mammals with big eyes. And if that mammal can stand up and look like us, so much the better. That's what they really like. We want things that look as much like us as possible. That's a big deal. If it doesn't look like us, make it a baby animal like a pangolin. Make it something that's, that's cute and attractive like this baby Malayan taper. He's, he's painted to look like the forest floor with dappled spots of light on it. Perfect camouflage while he waits for mom to come back. Baby everything, if I could shoot baby animals all the time, I probably would, but I can't. We've got a lot of ground to cover. We've shot 12,000 species out of the world's 20 to 25,000 in captivity so far after 15 years. We've learned that weird animals are good. The weirder, the better. If it's something that's kind of creepy, if it's an invertebrate, we usually save those for Halloween because that's when people will tolerate things that are not usual. Or we make them very colorful, like these ants that have clear bodies and you can see what color sugar water they've been drinking. 
during the pandemic, all of a sudden I'm grounded again. What do you do? There's a world of things in our own backyards. I learned that just looking at my porch lights going out to get the newspaper early in the pandemic. So we set up a portable studio and we went to a little prairie that we planted ourselves years ago. And we started in. Daughter Ellen helped me and my son Spencer did too. We learned that just in our own backyards and right around Lincoln, Nebraska, which is really heavy industrial agriculture with nothing, nothing moving, I thought, we'd run these different colored lights at night. We got over a thousand species of insects from Nebraska and neighboring states, things that were close enough to drive to in a day and back. They're like aliens. They're amazing. And without them, there's no us. We have to have insects. They provide us with pollination for fruits and vegetables. They control other insects. They're pests. They feed the rest of the food chain. They're a big deal. They're a really big deal. So each animal, no matter how small, no matter what it looks like, is an opportunity to me. It's a chance to, again, reach more people and finally land on something that somebody might care about. For whatever reason it is, we just need people to care about something other than the price of the pump and who's, who's in office and what's on TV and who won the ball game. It's the future of life on earth that's at stake now, folks. That's all there is to it. We don't want to let it get so bad that the public starts screaming for mercy because then it'll be kind of too late. We want to get on this now. We really do. We want, to sh we want to engage people over and over again, figuring that something will land, something will hit, and maybe finally the light will go off over their heads and they think, oh yeah, that's pretty cool. I had no idea. What would it take to save that animal? What can I do? Wouldn't I want my kids to see it? Wouldn't I want my grandkids to see it? These are all the things that run through the back of my mind. That's my... That's my wish anyway, that some of these will land in time. Folks ask me, well, what do the animals think about being photographed? That's very unusual for them. Well, most are born and raised in human care. They've been in zoos a, a long time. So, you know, he might not like the limelight, but he's eating a banana with his other hand during the shoot. So I figured his cage wasn't too rattled. Some animals are pretty shy when we go to do their picture. Some animals don't like being in my little shooting tent at all. These mice were plotting their escape, actually. Let's see, who else? Some, some animals hop right on me and they literally look at themselves as, as I'm editing. Usually primates, but sometimes birds too. I wanted to show you an easy, shirt, easy shoot and a hard shoot. This is an easy one. This lady was hand raising from eggs greater prairie chickens for a study she was doing. She, these, these birds get really wound up like bustards here. They just turn themselves inside out to perform for females. She's going to wave her hand and he's gonna, she's, she's convincing him that she's a threat. So he's going to come over and display for her. That's it. That's a, that's a pretty easy one, right? All right, now let's look at a hard bird. This is a bird that if all birds were like this, there would be no photo arc, guaranteed. Ready? Yeah. Ooh. Yeah. Not bashful bird. Not a bashful bird at all. Ow! Ooh, oh, crap. Oh man, this is one of those birds that's gonna try to blind me. I was asking about your lens. Yeah, okay, here we go. This is gonna be one of those things where I'm back here. Em, can you distract him in the back of the box? Roger. Roger. Oh, he did that. Yikes, you scared me. Ow, Give me some break. God dang it. Man, can he Please. bite? Can he bite? Holy cow. Yeah, look at how big and bad he is. Oh my God. Dang. Here we go, Reg. This is like a $6,000 camera. Doesn't he know that? Hey, 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 hey. Ow. God dang it. Do you like this bird, Jan? Yes, he's fantastic. <laughs> Raja. Raja. Look at his beautiful eyelashes. Yes, he is glorious. Got it, got it, got it. Nice. OK. All right, 
Done. Thank God. Time for lunch. All right, so that's, yeah, that's bad. That's not good. For big animals, the way we do big animals is we have the zoo paint a space, black or white. We put lights out of the way, either outside of wire or up in the ceiling. And then this is at the Oklahoma City Zoo. They had seven bison, each named after a character on the TV show Gilligan's Island, which is very popular around the world. So this is Mary Ann. They could move her anywhere they wanted to with mulberry leaves, and she stayed right there. Very simple, pretty simple. You got to talk the zoo into a lot of stuff, but you know, most of them, they want to participate. Uh, South China Tiger. It took about a year to get permission to go there and to paint that wall black. I painted it myself, and then you can use a pressure washer and get it off the concrete. This is what it looks like to your eye when you go in with available light. Crank the shutter up, start introducing flash, and uh, pretty soon maybe you can make a picture out of that. Tighten it like that. How about now, Joel? Yeah. Now stand there and point it down at her head, right down at her head. Oh, a little, uh, a little scared. Just pointed so at the I'm tiger. I'm worried that I won't be able to point the light to the direct spot that Joel want, want the picture to be. If you can summon the nerves. All right. Here we go. go ahead and try it again with your light. Real slow, real slow. Good. Good, good. Okay, keep it up. Are your arms getting tired, Elaine? It's fine. How? <laughs> It's fine. Thanks for asking, though. You're welcome. I care, you know. Yeah. Man, that looks good. That's one of the nicest tiger pictures I've ever got. Look at that. Just in a little dappled light. Looking beautiful. The eyes are all glowy. The whiskers stand out. It's worth coming here for, totally. OK. So that tiger wasn't very fond of the process, but 10, 15 minutes, that's okay. And he got, a lot, he got extra meat. Now, that was, uh, that was pretty easy, tiger. And most of these shoots, a lot of the birds, we shoot for a minute or two. Maybe it's six frames on white. We slide the white out. He remains in the 10 on black. Maybe it's 10 frames there. So it's not a lot, because we want to work quickly to reduce stress. This cat, just the opposite of the South China tiger. This is at the Cheyenne Mountain Zoo. All it takes is Prada. That's it. Most of the time, as I mentioned, we can see what people think about the images just by how they are behaving. And we can see that we can move the needle a lot more frequently by just flooding the market, just again and again and again. Especially with primates, that's what people react to the most strongly because they're a lot like us in terms of how they behave. They're social, they're playful, they're malicious, they're strong, they're aggressive. They're, you know, they get sleepy, they get hungry, just they're kind of like us. And I've had pretty good luck with them over the years, except for chimps. I haven't done very well with them. Here's why there's no chimps. What do you think? Does that look pretty good? All you can do is hope. They're pretty strong. I hear they can rip your, rip your uh, arm off and Beat it, beat right. you to death with it, right? Exactly. Yeah, pretty much. So now, doesn't this look nice? Doesn't this look nice? Perfect. It's perfect for chimps. They're not nice. So uh, we've talked about a lot of problems. Let's talk about solutions, too. I don't like people to just gripe. Um, giant panda, well, 
Chinese figured out how to breed them well in captivity, and they've set aside habitat, and that animal is fairly safe now, you know. And in North America, the whooping crane and the Mexican gray wolf, California condor, black-footed ferret, uh, Vancouver Island marmot, these were all animals that when I was a kid, we were pretty sure they were all going to go away. They were all down to fewer than two dozen each, but they didn't. And why didn't they? Well, just because people cared. And we have a great capacity to care. So I never give up. I just think about people like Rosa Maria Ruiz of Medici National Park. She was instrumental in getting the park established, and she certainly was instrumental in getting National Geographic interested in doing that story. I think about Don Butler and his wife, Anne, who are basically saving pheasants in their aviaries in Clinton, North Carolina. He's been doing this his whole life out of his own pocket. He had 11% of the world's Edward pheasants in his care when I was there last. That's an ex a bird that's now extinct in Vietnam. He and, his, he and his cohorts are breeding these birds to keep them alive until the woods stabilize and not everybody's shooting them all the time in Vietnam. As we were going through and doing these shoots in a big shooting tent so the birds can't even see us and they're calm in there, he says, I'm so glad you're here. There are no good pictures of any of these birds alive, Joel. Not a one of them. And I got every book ever printed. I said, well, how could that be? These things look like Vegas showgirls. He says they're too rare in the wild to photograph. They don't look good in captivity. They bump into the wire if you try to get a picture of them. They're mostly photographed just as dead skins in museums. That's what you see in the books. I'm like, well, if nobody's photographing a bird like that, they're certainly not concentrating on mice or sparrows or toads, anything that's small and brown. So I do. I care about them. Tilo Nadler, another conservation hero of mine, he, uh, he realized that there was a big problem in Vietnam when he went there on vacation for a month or two back in 1990. He could see a bunch of these baby primates were being confiscated by the Vietnamese government. They were being shipped into China for the pet trade, and they were being euthanized. He was, he was like, it wasn't my work, it wasn't, no, what I, it wasn't what I knew how to do, but he started the Endangered Primate Rescue Center in northern Vietnam, and he and his crew single-handedly saved this langer and this one just because they cared. That's amazing. I am constantly inspired and very happy to be meeting the people that I meet all the time, everywhere I go. For every photo art trip, I meet people that make me think, yeah, yeah, I'm psyched up. You bet. Jack Rudlow, he's an old guy now. He has a marine education center in Panacea, Florida. Doesn't have two nickels. He's brought hundreds of thousands of school kids there, elementary school kids, just to wonder at all the things he has, mainly in his touch tanks, from squid to urchins. Sandra Sneckenberger, who's with the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, she's devoted her life to saving beach mice. Mice. She knows that the beach mouse lives on the beach, and if you can protect the vegetation there, you keep everything from eroding in the next storm. The dunes are the protectors of the coastline. That saves billions of dollars in, in homes that it would have to be rebuilt or roads that would get washed away. Those mice are key to everything. She understands that. Or here, or here in the UAE, I came here... Uh, with the invitation of Simon Newton, and just started in. These are all from September. We got 249 species and subspecies, Arabian wolf, everything you can imagine, everything that, that lives here. Some of the world's finest collections are right here in the UAE. And we got permission to go into a lot of, a lot of places in Sharjah, and that opened up Dubai, Fujairah, Abu Dhabi. So that's great. That's fine. Whatever it takes. North African wildlife is some of the most imperiled in the world because the habitat, the world's getting hotter. Lots of people. Lots of people spreading out everywhere. Yeah. But it's an amazing place, and the collections here are fabulous. People couldn't have been better to us. This is at the Sharjah Aquarium. My high-tech rig there. We take, we, small fish look just like big fish, so we photograph a lot of smaller animals in these tanks that I have at the Dubai Falcon Center with a good friend who, who handles sea snakes, studies sea snakes in Fujairah. Or at Sheikh Bouti's private collection in Dubai with their primary guy there, Alan, their supervisor, who literally built a, a black room in their parking lot and created a shift, a shift shoot for a male lesser kudu to come in. And at the Arabian Wildlife Center here in Sharjah, we actually crossed the 12,000 species mark with an Arabian cobra. 
which is fantastic and very symbolic. You know, doing videos occasionally has become a little hobby of mine, especially with the animals I think are very, very special. So we've started a video arc now. We don't video everything, but we do the animals we think would be cool with it. And what I like about it is they, they just look like stills and then they start moving because video resolution is so good today. It can just look like a still. So it's a nice marriage between photo arc and movement. Could be an average thing like a horse fly cleaning off his eyes. Or a glass frog where you can see right through him and see his heart beating. Or a rattlesnake. Oops. Or a prey dog that's barking because his, he can see one of his buddies getting treats and he wasn't. So he's mad about that. Could be at a sloth nursery in Costa Rica. Sloths take about the same amount of energy to raise from infancy as, as primates do. It could be an orang when he sees his caretaker walking into the room with a bottle. Or it could be a woolly monkey seeming to discover his tail for the first time. Yes, it's there. Hummingbirds in Costa Rica were surprising. This is just in the, at a lodge. We put up black velvet and lit it. And uh, they're vicious. We watched one drown another one in that feeder. Amazing. We didn't know what was happening. We thought they were mating until the one just fell to the floor. They're really, really brutal, but amazing. So for all of these animals, what do we do with them? That's the important part. What do we do besides post them to social media and get them published in the geographic? Well, we give them away to every institution we work. Every place that we work gets images. They can use them for whatever they want. If they want to advertise a zoo or use them in anti-poaching campaigns for wall art, we don't care. Just give them lift. Let's get these pictures to go to work forever, long after we're all dead and gone. Hopefully these pictures can keep going to work and keep reminding people why the Earth's a great place still. Most of what you've seen today can be saved. We just have to have the wherewithal to stop and think and do it. We need to take a time out ourselves from all the habitat destruction and growth and carbon. Geographic's been a big supporter. We work off a, a National Geographic grant and had a lot of support from the magazine and their books division over the years, of course. They're start, these pictures are starting to be projected a lot onto buildings. This is at the COP Summit in Glasgow. They come in, these pictures come in handy for a lot of things. And Luis Sehoyos, the Oscar-winning winning director of The Cove, asked once in a while if he can borrow photos and video as well for some of his projections with the goal of just getting the world to talk and start to think about the way forward. Just get people talking about it. That's the first step. In 200 years, people will look back on this particular period and say to themselves, how did those people at that time just allow all these amazing creatures to vanish? But it would be very little use in me or anybody else exerting all this energy to save the wild places if people are not being educated into being better stewards than we've been. If we all lose hope, there is no hope. Without hope, people fall into apathy. There's still a lot left that's worth fighting for.
Pope was sitting right there watching it, which was nice. A long-term ad campaign for nature is what the photo arc is. But I guess in closing, I'd like to just ask you guys something. I mean, what are you going to do about this? I didn't know what else to do with this, really. But it's, it's the future of life on earth. And I know there's a lot of problems out there in this world, and the world's a big place, but maybe you start in your own backyard. Maybe you just think about how you spend your money. Is it tearing the world down or building it back up? You know, insulating your homes would be a good start. Eating less meat. Maybe, uh, maybe not buying so much single-use plastic. I don't know. Whatever it is, pick something, become an expert on it, and really dig into it and work on it over the years. Like, really make something count. Build a legacy of sorts. I mean, the good news is that, that it's not too late. We could turn things around if we want to. But it, it really depends on, I guess, who and what you want to see in the mirror at the end of your life, doesn't it? I mean, do you want to look in the mirror and smile, knowing that you did all you could to make the world better in some way? I hope so. You know, I'm doing all I can, really. Now, how about you? Thank you.